35 years ago, I became uh, Holland's first youth champion. And at that time, uh, there was only one thing on my mind, becoming as good as Fred Capps. Because in my opinion, there was not one magician in the world with so much charisma and so much technique. Now, okay, I'm all right, because a few years after that, I became world champion, like Fred Capps. Still traveling the world, from Tokyo to Paris, really wonderful after 35 years, and I've seen many, many, many magicians, illusionists, whatever you call them, but topping Fred Capps, no way. Absolutely not. But uh, some people say, especially the young people say, was he really that good? Okay, might be difficult to think that people are so good if you see a few things out of the past on television or on tape or whatever. But my few private sessions with Fred Capps, man, at that time I remember that I could understand those crazy girls with their Beatles going berserk over the Beatles because I went berserk over Fred Capps. I had sleepless nights. Hours and hours of Fred Capps, and he's not among us anymore, but the spirit and the legend of Fred Capps will go on forever. Thank you, Fred, wherever you are. Fred Capps, a magical name, one of the greatest of all time. I'm sure a lot of other people will tell Dick how great Fred was, but to me, Fred was a friend. As a matter of fact, uh, Dick told me that when he went through the files, Fred had over 100 letters that I had written to him about magic in California and the rest of the world. I used to travel as a journalist, and I'd always write Fred. He'd write me back, I would find out what was happening in Europe, and he would find out what was happening in California or any other parts of the United States where I was traveling and doing magic and uh, having a lot of fun. We got to travel together. We did shows together in Japan. We lectured together. We traveled uh, in different parts of the United States when he came over to perform for Dutch-speaking audiences. And he performed for the magicians at the Magic Castle and at various magic societies. I remember one in particular. We were uh, in Northern California, about four or five hundred miles north of Hollywood, where all the magicians lived at the Magic Castle. And Fred was going to do his lecture, and he was going to do one of the most famous tricks, was the dancing and floating cork. Well, Larry Jennings, probably one of the most famous close-up magicians in that time, heard that Fred was going to be up there, and he flew, he got an airplane, and he flew 400 miles <laughs> up to where we were, got there early in the morning into the lecture hall. There was no one else there. He just sat in the front row seat and waited all day for Fred to show up and do this trick. And it was a real tribute to Fred that somebody as, as important as Larry would go to that much trouble. And then another question we're always asked, what is your favorite trick that you saw Fred do? Well, there were many. Probably the one he was most famous for was where he uh, smoked his thumb. And for many, many, many years, as a matter of fact, forever practically, no one knows the secret of how he smokes his thumb. He kept that to himself. But probably for a selfish reason, my favorite trick is one that I invented, and I gave it to Fred, showed him how to do it, and he performed it a number of times on television specials in England and in Holland. And the effect was very simple. He was doing a trick with two people at a bar. He borrowed a finger ring from one of the people, tied it onto a string. While they were holding the string, the ring disappeared. Now Fred, being the actor, he felt like he was in trouble. It disappeared and he couldn't uh, make it come back. So he decided, well, let's have a drink. So he pours a drink for the lady. Then he turns to the guy, picks up the glass, and as he starts to pour the drink, the man's ring is on the stem of the wine glass. It is absolutely stuck there, his ring, and the only way Fred could get it off was to pick up a little hammer and break the glass. And that's how he, he got the, 
the, the ring off to give it back. And so my, it's probably a selfish reason because it was my trick that he was doing. Um, tricks with coins and close up at the table. There was no one else in his league. There might have been a few guys with more skill, but they were boring. They would do technical stuff and it was boring and people would walk away. But when Fred worked, he was so charming. He had what they say was an American smile and a British gentleman's manner. And, and that was, a, he could work for kings and queens, which he did. He worked for many royal families. He worked at Buckingham Palace for the Queen of England. He worked for, uh, I'm sure, Queen Beatrix here in Holland, um, Princess Grace in Monte Carlo. Fred was the gentleman. He'd walk into the room. He would be the best dressed man in the place. And the women all admired him. He was a great looking guy. We were all jealous of Fred's looks. We were in uh, Tokyo and one of the Japanese magicians, he was um, Takagi, Takagi-san. He wanted to take us around. So Fred and I got in the car and we went out to Mount Fuji. And we wanted to take a picture of ourselves, you know, and it was so foggy you couldn't see Mount Fuji at all. It was absolutely fogged in. So Fred got a great idea. We went over to a souvenir stand and we bought a poster, a big, big picture about two meters wide of Mount Fuji. And he had somebody hold it up behind us. <laughs> and so we took our pictures with the Mount Fuji. You could see it very clearly because it was a picture of it. So that was a lot of fun. Fred was always fun and he was always doing little bits of magic that uh, were totally unexpected. He was a magician 24 hours a day, but he was also a student of magic. When he wasn't performing professionally, he'd hang out with the boys and they would try to fool each other. And I've uh, seen a film of Fred actually fooling some magicians with their own tricks, tricks they had invented, but Fred improved them. He made them so much better, and when he did the, the effect for the inventor, the inventor didn't even recognize it as his own trick. And a perfect example was Brother Hammond. Brother Hammond had a trick using what was called the Hammond count. So Fred was doing his trick, and I was watching it, and it suddenly dawned on me, he's not doing it the way Hammond did it. He's turned the card sideways, and it looks like he's shuffling him. And Brother Hammond it went right by him and he fooled him with his own trick because he didn't see him uh, do the effect. The, uh, oh boy, what else? There's so many stories. Fred was in Tokyo on the same show. Uh, I was backstage, I'd finished, and the uh, orchestra playing the music in Japan, 17-piece orchestra, and they accidentally started on page two with the sheet music. They were off one song, and each tr trick that Fred did had a particular song that went with the trick. And the audience had no idea, but poor Fred, he's up there, and you can see him, he's glancing over at the musicians and giving them this look, and he's kind of trying to direct them and make them, they didn't understand. And uh, Johnny Thompson was there, and he ran over, he ran over to the guy, because he saw the music was wrong. He tried, but the Japanese guy had no idea. So Fred kept going, the professional that he was. We finished the act, and you know, I mean, as much as it bothered him and myself and John, because we knew there was a problem, the audience didn't know it, and he got a standing ovation. I mean, they absolutely loved him. So wherever Fred went, the audiences loved him. And that was his key. He was the most charming of all the magicians on stage. Skill, yeah. Better than most, yeah. But charming more than anyone. The all-around best I've ever seen in my life. Fred, we miss you. Fred Cups, for his time, was the perfect magician. With humor, with a big smile, with the body language, with perfect technique, and what I mentioned, the charm for the ladies. I think everybody liked him. Most of them all, uh, of course, the ladies in the audience. He was a charm. I saw a TV show when I was about 17, and uh, we did not have a TV at home, and I went to a cafeteria, and I looked and there was a black and white show from a German convention in Hamburg and there were several acts uh, 
which did not intrigue me, but suddenly somebody came on stage and he had this natural behavior. Everything happened just like I dreamed always to be a magician. So and I think this was like turning the switch and I started to do manipulation. I said, this is the real thing. And a year later, I saw him live in San Andrea Bani and it was my first convention and I was, uh, there were all the masters, Sylvan and Fred Cups and uh, um, all the big heads and um, uh, from England, to Bill Stickland and all the, uh, and on the gala, or let's say it was a competition for a medal, a golden medal, I think so, I can recall. There was Fred Cup's life and he did this with his music and his uh, salt and money and everything was at that time something I later could really recall when I started uh, to see him, to, to meet him, to talk to him and uh, um, he was very nice at that time because he took his hand around me and said, the young boy, you have to train <laughs> to practice, you know, so, and uh, I was like this, you know, to see a master in front of me, so we got to know each other better later on, and uh, it was, let's say for me, it was always uh, the feeling uh, that everything had a, a cause, everything was on purpose, every move was on timing and not uh, because he did a trick, he did a miracle. So uh, later on uh, I was uh, with him with in a, for an invitation convention in, in Monte Carlo and uh, it was one day we sat together with Mike, uh, Mike Skinner that's the name and Fred Cups and me we sat in a little so in a, a couch with a coffee table around, we had some coffee and we were talking privately and suddenly Mike Skinner started to do a trick and I said, ah, I know a variation on this and Fred said, I know a variation on this and it started to mingle and mix and we each other uh, showed us tricks. We did not care for them, the surrounding but suddenly people started to stop by and watch what we did. It was tiny little tricks. It was just talking about presentation, holding, so, and we, we realized uh, we are in the middle of a group and suddenly a hundred people were standing around us and so we had a kind of jam session, a jam session and we, we, we fighted each other doing tricks and we blinked the eyes and we forced cards to each other or to a spectator and Mike Skinner um, could uh, say what card it was and then uh, Fred produced the card out of a deck and I was forcing a card from my deck so it was it was super duper and it was uh, a highlight I think for this convention for many people and when um, both of them are not among us anymore but many people come up to me and said hey I remember this uh, jam session and this fight you had. I said I did not have a fight. We had the greatest time uh, ever and for me it was uh, always when I saw him we said ah, can you remember this time and it's very seldom I would like that more magician, good magician would stay in the middle of a group and do tricks for the others to show them how it's done. Only in the last years I realized uh, how important uh, all these things were for me uh, as I started to um, research or make researches about the life of Hofzinger and then I saw in the letters one thing Fred Capps always did, maybe because he, of his natural talent or because somebody told him or I don't know, but in the letters of Hofzinger they are from 1847 there's a very important sentence and he said to his friend you should do your tricks like a rope without knots so nothing should hinder and remember everything what you do should have a cause everything you do uh, should be on purpose and nothing done just because it has to be done and for me it made again a click and I said yeah it was the same feeling I had 
when I saw Fred Cups doing the television show, being able to do things on purpose, to turn around, to make the right moves and to have the right body language. You don't have to run around on stage like some magician might do today and, and have stage presence. No, you have just to have your right body language and he was in this thing perfect. For the first half of my career, I was a musician with a very big name act called Jerry Mirage Harmonicats. And when I left them and decided to get back into magic, I went to my friend Jay Marshall and I said, who is the best magician in the world? And he said, well, undoubtedly Fred Capps. And I thought to myself, well, I have to be as good as Fred Capps if I'm going to get anywhere in the world. And it took many years for me, but he was, he was the personification of a great magician and that's who I wanted to be, Fred Capps. I had to be as good as Fred. And one of the great things that ever happened in my life uh, the, I followed Fred into Joe Stevens' last magic convention. And during that convention, they asked Fred who his favorite close-up magician was, and he said me. And I said, my goodness, if I've achieved that, I've achieved everything I tried to do because I had to be as good as Fred. And if I was his favorite close-up magician, then I think I may have arrived a little bit. And I met Fred for the first time at Jay Marshall's. He was doing one of the Dutch clubs in Chicago. And we met, and you know, when you meet Fred Capps, the personification of his personality is incredible, you know. He exuded magic to me, and I had my first session with, with him at Jay's, and uh, I was just absolutely in awe. And then we became closer and closer friends. And Fred, for me, the great thing about Fred Capps, uh, it was uh, Robert Houdin, the father of modern magic, who said, uh, when they asked him what a, a magician was all about, he said, a magician is a, an actor playing the part of a, a magician. Not just a magician, but an actor. And then it was John Neville Maskelyne who said, uh, no, it's, it's a, an actor playing the part of a great magician. And if anything, Fred was the greatest actor in magic I ever saw. When he walked on stage and he looked out to that audience, he just grabbed everyone and you believed everything he did because the acting level was so high. And so when magicians come to me and they say, uh, well, I don't understand what they mean by uh, a magician is a, an actor playing the part of a magician, I said, just look at Fred Capps. Fred personifies everything. When, when he looks at something, you look at something. When he investigates something, you investigate it with him. And uh, his acting ability made the magic so real for all of us. And that's why it was so great. Fred was not only a great technician, but just the most marvelous performer I ever got the chance to witness working. I worked with him on a few occasions. The last time I was with Fred was about six months before he passed on. We were working, it was 1980, and we were working in uh, Tokyo, Japan, for the JMS Society. And I was having a little problem, and Fred came over to me and pulled me off to the side, and he said, I know you're upset about conditions, but he said, remember, we're here to have a good time, and when we perform, we always have a good time. Don't let this get in the way. And he just reinforced uh, the good things about our business, and uh, consequently, I went out and had a great show uh, instead of an upset one, you know. And uh, I miss Fred very, very much. He was uh, one of the great forces, maybe the, the greatest single magician, uh, stage performer in my lifetime, you know, a chance to see. And uh, it was great to know him, share secrets with him, and uh, I'm, I'm just glad I was alive in his lifetime. Well, to me, Fred Capps was the consummate magician. Uh, many magicians considered him the greatest magician of his time. And, and not just in one area. That's the thing that impressed me the most. He was uh, a great magician in every facet of magic. You could put him on stage in front of a group of magicians and he would be superlative. Well, great enough to win the world championship three times. Or you could put him on stage in front of laymen and he could be hilariously funny doing 
uh, what most magicians would consider standard effects. Uh, talking magic, he would get huge laughs, and, and they would love him. You could put him in a formal close-up session, <clears throat> and he would perform exquisite close-up magic with his, the, oh, his own routines that he had worked out. And uh, I've also seen him perform in a casual setting, just strolling around at a party, um, mingling with people, and then sitting on the couch or just with some, uh, a few people around doing impromptu magic. And he would kill the people with his extraordinary uh, close-up magic. Most of us would be satisfied to uh, excel in any one of these areas, and Fred was absolutely tops in each one of them. Uh, you have to admire that about anybody. The other thing that I admired about Fred was, first of all, his unbelievable skill. He practiced and practiced and practiced throughout his whole life. Uh, the, the reason I think he was able to do this is not only was he a professional magician, he was also uh, a hobbyist. His hobby was magic. And so it wasn't work. It wasn't, well, I have to spend the next few hours practicing. I think he looked forward to that. And because of this, he developed ex extraordinary digital dexterity. And his sleight of hand ability was at par excellence. And to go with that was the fact that he was such a great actor. And they say that uh, magicians are actors playing the part of a magician. Well, Fred took that to the extreme. He was a really great actor, and you believed everything that was happening in his act. If he looked confused, you believed he was truly confused. And if something apparently went wrong, you really went, uh oh, he's in trouble. And of course, he wasn't in trouble. That's exactly what was supposed to happen. So the combination of uh, tremendous skill and his great acting abilities all put together produced this, this world famous and world class magician. I'm thrilled that I got to know Fred uh, over a, the course of many years. I was much younger than he, but, but I had the advantage of being able to go to magician's conventions because I worked for a magic company and we uh, produced precision made coin tricks for magicians. And uh, I would see Fred at conventions, and he would come and look at the, the coins that I had for sale. And he really appreciated the quality and the craftsmanship that went into them. These coins weren't available in Holland, and of course the first thing that he thought of was, can I get these coins made in Dutch gelders? Well, I was in such awe of Fred Capps, I would have made anything that he wanted, and in fact did make him many, many gimmick coins that he could take back to Holland and fool everybody, including the magicians with. So I, I got to see him in many situations, both casually close-up situations, formal close-up situations, and, and on stage, and uh, became a huge Ken, uh, Fred Capps fan. I almost said Ken Brook, because in 1976, I made my first visit to Ken Brook's shop in London, and I wasn't sure what to expect. I knew that it was a, a famous, wonderful magic shop, and when I went in, there wasn't there weren't shelves full of tricks. It was a very simple store. But on the bookshelf across the room was this book, The Magic of Caps. And I thought, oh my, I've never heard of such a book. And, and I leaped across the room and grabbed this book to make sure no one got it before me. And I opened it up. It said, published by Ken Brooks Magic Place in 1976. Well, that's why I'd never heard of it. It was a brand new book. And I turned the page, and it was autographed by Fred Capps. I thought, this is my lucky day. Well, by this time, Ken Brook is, is laughing out loud, and I'm not paying any attention to, to Ken. And I continued to open the pages, and that's when I discovered that uh, the magic of Capps was a big joke. It was a blank book, and that's why Fr uh, Ken was laughing. Some years later, when uh, Fred Capps passed away, uh, many of his uh, magic items personal items were auctioned off. And the one thing that I wanted was Fred's copy of this blank book. And that's when I got this book. And this book sits on my bookshelf at home. And even though there's no magic in it, it's one of my favorite books. And every time I see it, I think, first of all, of the many times I got to see Fred perform around the world. And uh, that, of, of course, many happy memories. And also of uh, my first visit to Kenbrook and when I grab this book off his bookshelf. Someday I hope that I have next to this book on my bookshelf, The Real Magic of Fred Capps, a big thick book that has all of his great routines in it, and that is a day that I look forward to. 
When I was a young magician, I bought, uh, like every young magician, a vanishing cane. And I'm one of the, the magicians who preferred to roll the cane in a piece of newspaper and then unroll the newspaper and show that the cane had vanished. Well, then I saw Fred Capps do it, and I saw what I couldn't figure out. And he brought so much to this standard, simple trick. He would roll the cane up in the newspaper just the way I did, but then he would bring out the salt shaker. And of course, that gave him the perfect logical excuse to get rid of what needed to get rid of. I had to try and do it secretly. He did it completely openly with a, a logical explanation for that, and no one noticed it. The little salt shaker came out, and as if the, the salt was the magic that was going to make the cane disappear, apparently no salt was coming out, boom, the salt shaker disappeared in midair. Um, then the newspaper was unrolled, the cane had vanished, and before you had a chance to react to that, as he folded up the newspaper, now he had a lit candle in his hand. And, and this was a great example of, he took a good trick, what can I now do with this trick? How can I make this better? And uh, he thought about it, he thought about it a lot, and he figured out, I have to get rid of this gimmick, Instead of trying to sneak it away, I will use a logical means to dispose of the gimmick. That gets the salt shaker into play. I don't want to just set the salt shaker on a table. If I'm a real magician, why can't I take this salt shaker, boom, and dis make it disappear in midair? And now the, the cane disappears, which is the point of this whole trick. And instead of just folding up the newspaper and setting it on the table, as he folds it up, there's a lit candle in his hand. He's surprised as anyone by this. Fantastic. Made, made me go home and think about all the tricks I was doing. What would Fred do if he had this trick? How would he enhance it and improve it? One of the tricks that I saw Fred do uh, a number of times was the 11-bill trick. And, and I loved that trick because uh, maybe I think the same uh, as Fred did. When you watch Fred, no matter which act he was doing, he rarely used, not always, but rarely used things that came from the magic shop. He used things that were familiar to people. Uh, newspaper, candles, canes. These were things that people uh, understood as opposed to uh, props that only exist in the magic shop. So when he did the uh, 11 bill trick, which was originally um, Edward Victor's 11 card trick, he took what was already a good trick and, and changed the object. Instead of using cards, he used dollar bills, which I think made the trick more amazing. The fact that these bills are much bigger than cards, they're difficult to conceal in your hand. And people, normal people, are just more interested in money than they are in playing cards. And that made an added uh, element to this trick. And he now had to figure out, how can I hide dollar bills um, instead of cards? It was much more difficult. Well, he figured out a very elegant solution to that problem. And again, when he did the 11 bill trick, the thing that made it the great piece of theater that it was, was as I mentioned before, his tremendous ability as an actor. And it was, he was confused by every time they counted the money, another dollar bill had disappeared. He didn't know where they were going. He was trying to get on track and get enough money to present the 11 bill trick and everything went wrong. And he was as befuddled as the two spectators that were helping him. Um, not always, but on a couple of occasions, Fred explained his routine for the 11 bill trick. And fortunately, I was at one of those. So I felt, OK, Fred taught this trick at his lecture. Now I have the rights to do it. And I, I worked a lot on the routine myself. And in fact, I think I did what Fred did whenever he got a trick. I didn't want to do exactly what Fred Capps did, not that I could ever duplicate that. But I took his existing routine and uh, I tried to figure out what would fit me better. And, and it has changed over the years. Uh, the, change, the routine has been modified quite a bit. And now it's one of my favorite tricks to do. And um, it's, a, it's slightly different than the way Fred did it, but I'm sure he would approve uh, of someone that took his original and adapted it to suit himself. So, so when asked, what is your favorite Fred Capps trick, I think I would have to say, whatever trick I was watching Fred perform at the time, that would be my favorite, whether it was the floating cork or his stage act or the giant Chinese coins. Each one seemed perfect when you saw it.
Well, I first met Fred Capps in 1952. He came to London um, and appeared in a place called the Coconut Grove, which was a very exclusive nightclub. And uh, he had heard of me and he phoned me. We'd never met before and I went to see him and I, I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. Because there was a very tall, elegant, good-looking young man. I hated him straight away. <laughs> There's too much competition for me, but it was it made such an impact because uh, to this day, now this is 50 years later, more than 50 years later, people say to me, who's the best magician you've ever seen? And I can't answer that because there are different categories of illusionists, manipulators, but the all the all round best magician, I think, was Fred Capps. He was a cabaret artist, he was a stage personality, he did wonderful close up, and, and he made a huge impact uh, with magicians. So to me, he was the greatest all round magician we've had in the last 50 years. <laughs> Well, later on, uh, Fred became a regular uh, visitor to London, and uh, when Channing Pollock appeared in the late 50s, um, we used to go out together, and one day we were sitting having dinner, and we discovered that we're all the same age. We were born, well, should I tell you? Yes, I will tell you. 1926, we were born, all three of us, all within a month and a half, June, July, and August. And so we are very old men, but uh, we don't look it. Fred really had two sides to him. Uh, on stage and in Cabri, he was a, a real charmer, he was good looking, all the ladies uh, used to uh, be very attracted to, to this very elegant man. But because, like most perfectionists, he was a big warrior and he used to be in very bad tempers when he was creating illusions and tricks and routines because nothing was ever good enough for him and so sometimes he had a very bad mood and um, sometimes I went to his home and uh, saw that he, he wasn't this charming person that we all knew but as soon as he had solved the problem and as soon as he uh, perfected it then he was fine again but I think we're all like that we have to make sure that the routines really work and, and really look good but he was never satisfied with his work everybody else thought it was perfect he never did well opus 13 came about because I did a lot of things with the number 13 and when we were discussing the title of the show uh, it was quite obvious it would be something 13 and we said opus 13 and Fred Capps was the compere he introduced the show and I did all kinds of things that people couldn't understand. It was like the later uh, Uri Geller did. Um, and so they were saying, this is all real, this is not magic. And there were a lot of discussions. And I said, no, I'm just an entertainer. And um, later on, because of a hypnotic show, uh, there were some uh, worries that people had fallen asleep in their homes. And the press started asking Fred uh, why he was involved in such a show. And he said it was only supposed to be an entertainment. We didn't mean to cause problems like that. And another time they were shooting at me and I had to uh, avoid live bullets, real bullets and fake bullets. And again, it caused a scandal in the papers. And the papers were absolutely full of it, months on end. We actually made uh, the series in October 1966 until May 67, and it uh, it was uh, the papers were absolutely full every day, every month from the beginning to the end. Of all my scrapbooks, I have at least uh, four big scrapbooks full of of the, the that period from Holland. And every time they mention it, of course, Fred Capps was mentioned because Fred was a big hero in Holland because he had won the Grand Prix at uh, at the in Barcelona in 1950 and so he became a big Dutch hero and until the day he died and uh, it was quite young when we lost him they always mentioned that he was a world champion <laughs>